All right. So Pastor Chris has left me the real meat of this stuff. <laughs> Some amazing passages we got to deal with, and I'll do my best not to overwhelm us with too many verses, because then we won't, there's no way we'll get through them. But we've got 10, 10 chapters to go through. We're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 26, and we're looking at David's life. And if you need a Bible, anybody needs a Bible, just raise your hand. Dan will make sure that you get one. Okay. But we're picking up in, in chapter 26 of 1 Samuel. And here, David has been on the run from, from Saul for seven years, at least seven years. You know, we don't have real good accounting through the scriptures of exactly the time frame. So there's about a... a five to 10 year time frame that we kind of base this on. Right now where we pick up in this, this story should be about 1015 to 1010 BC. Somewhere in there, and that's, that's pretty much the duration of where we're gonna be. Some say that it was closer to 10 years that he ran. Others say closer to seven, that this kind of goes just rapid fire here in these spots, but, but nobody can be for sure because we don't get a really accurate account of where we're at in the, the scheme of time. And we see something similar tonight. Something's, some of this is going to sound very familiar to you if you've been reading through the Bible with us in the two-year plan that just a um, couple chapters before, we had seen something very similar where David had the chance to take Saul's life and take the throne. And he found he was convicted when he had the chance, when he had the knife out and ready to slay Saul in the, in the cave. And he ended up just cutting a part of his robe off. He took the fringes of his robe, which crushed David after he had done it because he realized that he had removed the authority that God had placed on King Saul. He had cut away the, the garment, those fringes, talked of his authority, his kingship, his anointing, and David by his own hand cut that away from Saul and realized after he had done it that he was convicted that it's not for any man to remove an anointing of God but only for God to remove that. And from there on, we see that same thing play out in David's life. And this is a character that we need to be about as well. This is something that we really need to, to take heed of because David takes that lesson that he learned before and takes it even farther and tries to teach somebody else that same lesson here tonight. Picking up in verse one, we'll read the first three, ver four verses, excuse me. Now, the Zephonite came to Saul at Gibbet saying, uh, is David not hiding in the hills of Hakli, opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Now Saul encamped in the hills of Hakli, which are opposite Jeshimon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies to understand that Saul had indeed come. So here we've got the same character that set everything up before, that got Saul on the, the trail of David, a Zephonite. Same one that seems to be the same one that had told Saul right where David was before when David was able to catch him in the cave. And so we've got the same thing taking place again. And again, David finds himself with an opportunity here as we jump forward just a little bit uh, to verse eight. Now Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right in the earth, and I will, have no, have, I will not have to strike him a second time. Now, we're gonna read on here a little bit more, but I wanna stop here for a second, because here again, we've got 3,000 sleeping men is what the picture is here, all encamped around Saul, Saul in the center of them. David and one other man, his nephew as a matter of fact, um, Daughter, son of his, his sister, walk right through these men because God, as we'll read in a minute, put them into a deep sleep. David steps right up to Saul without waking one of these men and sees a pot of water 
and a spear stuck in the ground. And this man's act, automatic reflex here is God has delivered him into your hand today. Let me kill him for you. Read verse nine. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, therefore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. On this day, on his day, or his day, excuse me, shall come that he die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now that spear, the spear, and the jug of water that are by his head, and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head. And now it, uh, and knew it, oh, uh, wait a minute, I lost my track. And no men saw or knew it or awoke, for they fell asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Here we've got a picture of David in the same situation again, and it seems even more like the Lord has opened the door for him to do these things. It even says that the Lord caused the sleep to be on all of Saul's men that were protecting him. Notice David does not look at the situation. He looks at God who he knows who he has worshiped his whole life, and he trusts completely in him, and he allows himself to be governed, or the peace of the Lord, as we learn in the New Testament, that that should be an empire in our heart. Without that peace, it doesn't matter what the situation looks like, it's not of the Lord. David takes very high regard for who the Lord has raised up and put in an office and of, of authority over him. And here's where I'm gonna probably rub some people the wrong way. This is something we as Christians should really take very close look at. We see people outside the church that do not know God talk about having respect for an office, not a person. That office was put in place by God and the people that get put in there, even if it was by underhanded, sneakery, impossible tampering with votes, wasn't done without the Lord allowing it. If we have an ungodly leader in a place of authority over us, it's because we as a nation have become ungodly. It's called judgment. And God will chasten and try to judge and deal out small portions of judgment over and over until a nation either turns back from him, to him, or continues its descent away. This very same principle goes into the household. The Lord has called the man to be the leader of the house, the priest of the house. That means he is to lead in a godly way. When he doesn't, that doesn't mean that his wife has to come under his authority and do the things that are ungodly. But he is gonna be held accountable for every single thing that he does and the way that that household is led. It also comes under the church. If you sit in a church under the, a pastor, you need to believe wholeheartedly that that pastor has been put in that authority role the, as a shepherd of that church by the hand of God. The day that you do not believe that, you don't belong in that church any longer. This is holding God's standing in high regard and the things that his word says in high regard. Doesn't mean that any man is without fault. Doesn't mean that a pastor, a husband, or a president, or a king will not make mistakes. All that God has, as Pastor Chris said a few weeks ago where we were in the book of Gideon, or Judges and we've seen Gideon and the way that his reign ended. All that God has to work with are broken vessels. Doesn't remove the authority that God has given them. And we see that character of David on mighty display here 
David being the actual king of Israel by the hand of God, but he would not remove the man that God put in place. He would allow, allow God to only do that. Very important lessons. Verse 14. Excuse me, let me catch up in my notes. Hmm. Before we go there, there is one, one passage in Romans I think we should all turn to. 13. Romans 13. Just so we know this is also a New, new Testament principle. And we'll pick up in verse 1. Let every soul be jud- subject to the government, governing, governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will be judged. Judgment will come upon themselves. For rulers are not... a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on who practices evil. Therefore, you must subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because you have also paid taxes, because of this you also pay taxes, and for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. As I said, this is absolutely a a New Testament principle. David lives it out perfectly here and shows us what it means to be a godly person. This is part of the godly character that God referred to as a man after his own heart. He held God and God's appointing to such high esteem. Verse 14, back in 26 of 1 Samuel. And God called out the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, do you not answer Abner? Now, Abner is the, the main protector of Saul. He is, he is the right-hand man of Saul. He should lay down his life for Saul. And Abner answered and said, who are you calling out, to, who is calling out to the king? So David said to Abner, are you not a man, and who is like you in Israel? Why have you not guarded your Lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord, the king. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed, and now see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son, David? David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And we go right back into the same thing that Saul did before. He gives this long, repentant speech with tears. But they were crocodile tears. Again, we see somebody who's sorry about the situation he's found himself in, and that's what he is repenting of. Much like we see with Judas after the crucifixion of Christ. The scripture says that he repented unto himself. He didn't repent and turn away from who he was. He felt sorry for himself is what that comes down to. Saul is in that same situation where he's feeling sorry for himself and says, I will not touch you. I will not lay a hand on you. Again, these same promises they had made before, yet here he is 
swayed to come back out by his flesh to take out the man that should take, be on his throne. Verse 25 ends this chapter with, then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son, David. You shall both be gr do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Now you notice David goes on his way. He doesn't return back to the kingdom. He doesn't go back into Israel because he has seen this all before. He uses some wisdom here, but here we see such a great character of David and mighty wisdom by him knowing that this is deceitful repentance. It's not true repentance. And it's good wherever somebody repents to stand a ways off and see what comes of it. Yes, we are to forgive immediately. But if repentance is true, there's gonna be actions that follow it. There's gonna be a changed life behind it. The actions will not be repeated that he's repented from if it's true repentance. Now, with that being said, here we are a bunch of Christians that know that we repent, that we feel bad, and that we fall on our face over and over for the same thing. And that's because we allow our flesh to rule our lives more so than we do with the Holy Spirit. The ball's right back in our court. But there should be a change. There should be a brokenness that comes with this that leads to changes. And the Lord uses all of those failures even in our lives to continue to mold us into the person that he created us to be. Now David goes out and does the exact opposite of everything that I just praised him for. Now he follows the flesh. We don't find one time in chapter 27 that he sought the Lord. He figured out how to preserve himself and stay out of the clutches of Saul and his men. And he and his men went and encamped with the enemy. David goes into the, the land of the Philistines. Let me catch my notes up. And makes a truth with the king there. And actually even proves by the raiding that he has done, supposedly in the nation of Israel, and all the spoils that he's bringing back, that he is a man that has deserted Israel completely and is all about the Philistines and convinces the king of this. But let's read, uh, picking up chapter 27, verse seven. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided uh, Gashura, the Gizites, the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old. As you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt, wherever David attacked the land, he left no man, neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkey, the camels, and the apparel and returned to the king to come to Achish, which was the king of the, the Philistines. Then Achish would say to him, where have you raided today? And then David goes into this long lie that he's been raiding the different southern areas of Judah, that he is a true man who has deserted Israel. Lie after lie. Now, the problem with this is when we lie, when we put ourselves in these situations, when we find ourselves encamped with the enemy, those lies will be found out. Notice that it says that he killed every woman and every man. That's also every child. Not one person who could speak could be left alive because somebody may return to the king and let him know that he had not attacked Israel at all. They'd been attacking their neighbors. So think of that. The lies and the sin that he has allowed in, just as Pastor Chris says all the time, every sin leads to death. If it's not the physical death right that moment, it's the death of the feeling in your heart. Your heart becomes a little bit more callous to sin. 
your feeling dies. Relationships die. Your standing as a good spiritual leader dies when you compromise and encamp with the enemy. We go right on into chapter 28 now and picking up in verse one. Now it happened in the days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So all these Hebrew men have to join with the enemies of their own people and go and fight against their own people. Here's where he has set himself and all of his men up. This is the leader of God. This is the man that after God's own heart making a great blunder here and putting every man that's under his authority in harm's way and ready to do something very evil. This is what happens every time that we compromise. We put people around us in harm's way as leaders. Verse two, so David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Forever, David is looking to be on the side of the enemies of God. Again, all that God has is broken vessels to use. This is one of the things that I love about the word of God. It doesn't sugarcoat any of this. It doesn't whitewash any of these characters. It doesn't pretend like they were without flaw. I can relate to people like this. And it also gives me hope in the middle of my failures that God can still use me. That God says and means what he says when he spoke through John in one nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. That word that he is just, he is justified by forgiving me when I sin as long as I come to him with repentance. He cleanses us and sets us free from that thing that has ensnared us again. And we see God's hand moving here, protecting David and his men. When you jump over to verse four through six, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shurnam. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired to the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dream or uman or by prophet. The Lord is far away from Saul at this point. Saul has done things his own own way for so long he has lost any presence of the Lord or any guidance by the Lord. This is a, a scary place to be as a leader. And as I've said over and over, if you have accepted Christ, if you have trusted in him for your salvation, at that very moment, you became a leader. Scripture says you are an ambassador of the king to a lost and dying world. You know a little bit more about the Lord, your God, than that person that has never accepted him. The Lord expects you to lead. And here is Saul with absolutely no presence of the Lord, no guidance of the Lord, nothing is coming to him. And I wanna use this opportunity to talk about us even when we're in the middle of God's will, knowing that we're right where he's called us to be, that we're doing the things that he's called us to do and all of a sudden he feels very distant. And we've looked through everything that we've been doing and we can't find where we could have done something wrong that he stepped away. We can find ourselves in that situation. I I hope I'm not the only one that's felt that way before. But 
what I learned very quickly with my walk with the Lord was it's not about feeling. And it's not always about even hearing. So often he has poured into me everything that I need to know about what the next right thing is, that he wants me to step in that without his leading, that he expects me to do so. Because this relationship with the Lord is growing and it's just like any other relationship, there are things that I should be doing in my house without my wife saying to do them. And it should be evident to me. And there are those times where he just seems silent. It's because the next step is pretty obvious. I'm just wanting a way out maybe. But here we've got a completely different situation with Saul. And Saul takes it one step further. He has disobeyed the Lord at every turn. He has taken his authority and abused it in every way. And now... Picking up in verse 12, we've got to really spend some time on this, and I hate it, but we've got a lot to cover, but we've got to do this. Let's look at verse 12. Uh, make sure that's where I'm supposed to start. Yep, so just to fill in here. So he couldn't find, hear from the Lord, so somebody comes and tells him that there's still a medium in the land that he could go to and see if he could get direction from Samuel, who, remember, he had died right at the end of Chris's last teaching. Um, verse 12. When the woman saw Samuel, oh, I left a lot out. So he goes to this woman, and he puts on a disguise, pretends, pretends like he's not Saul, and he convinces her to, to summon Samuel for him, for him, the dead Samuel. And this median thinking you know, that he, there's some man trying to set her up because he had removed all of, the, all of the medians and prophets and spiritualists in the land, which again is not quite what God had said, but she was worried that he was going to, to expose her, but he convinces her that he's not Saul, he's not an enemy, so she does this thing and something strange happens. Now, this is a medium who's probably been dealing with actual, um, what's, the, what's the word I'm not grasping? Uh, familiar spirits. Medians are real. That's why God tells us to stay away from them. They do deal with demons. They do not talk to anything good. But this is completely different than anything she's ever dealt with before. Let's pick up in verse 12 now. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, you have deceived me, for you are Saul, the king. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What, did you, what do you see? And the woman said, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, what was his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now I wanna stop right there for a second and just look at this. She is greatly afraid because this is not at all how it's ever happened before. Every time before, most likely, she was dealing with a familiar spirit, one who either would wouldn't have all the information that he, she needed at the time, would leave her alone, then come back, give her more information, give her things that she needed to be able to do these. This was not that spirit. This was not the demon that she was used to dealing with. As a matter of fact, I don't believe this is a demon at all. I have went back and forth over the years what I thought about this passage. I'll tell you where I land today. This is actually Samuel. The scripture gives us no indication of anything otherwise. And one way that you can tell when it is demonic, when it is something pretending to be someone of God, they're always going to twist things. They're always going to give a deceitful account. We don't get that here. He actually tells Samuel exactly what's going to take place, and it all sounds like it's coming from the Lord. Now, does that mean that this is something that can be done today? That you as a Christian should go to a median and get 
get some answers from some dead people? Absolutely not. This is a very rare occasion. This is something the Lord does not do often. This is not something that I can see that the Lord has ever done again. There's the most similar thing that I can find anywhere in scripture would be the Mount of Transfiguration, where two men that didn't die but had ascended into heaven stood on the Mount of Transfiguration and had a conversation with our Lord. They came out of glory and spoke. Something else that comes to mind with these things is what God did through Paul in the book of Acts. Let me see if I can flip there real quick. In Acts 19, 11, it says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul. So there are times where God does things that are a little bit different than what we should be expecting. Is his way above our ways? We don't always have the answers for why he did something a certain way. I can just trust that his word tells me that this is Samuel and that Samuel responds as if he is Samuel. And then I trust the Lord with the rest of it. Now, I do want to go through a couple things about a median here once we get there, but let's read the rest of this account, picking up in verse 15. Now, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul said, I am deeply distressed for the Philistines make war against me. Notice it's against me not the people of God. Everything's always self-centered with anyone that's far from God. For the Philistines have made war against me and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither through the prophets or by dream. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, so why do you ask me? Seeking the Lord, seeing that the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy, wow. And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalekai. Amalek, excuse me, which is an Amalekite. <laughs> Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell on full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the word Samuel, words of Samuel. And he was and there was no strength in him, for he had not eaten all day or all night. So carrying on with this, we know that it said that Samuel had put out the medians and the spiritualists, the spiritist. Back in, didn't mark it. No, oh, he had, and that's what she even mentioned here that she had put that they had put. He had put out all of her kind, so she, that's why she was scared of him. Uh, Leviticus 19.31 says, give no regard to medians and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 verse six says, and the person who turns to medians and familiar spirits to, uh, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that that person will be cut and cut him off from his people. Isaiah 8, 19, which would have been after this, but it still falls into this. And when they say to you, seek those 
who are medians and wizards and whispers and mutterers, should not a people seek after God instead? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? And then to end it, Leviticus 20, 27 says, a man or a woman who is a median or has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. In other words, he disobeyed even with this. He only drove them out of the land. So they were still available when needed. And this is a picture of how a lot of people play with sin. They keep it just at arm's reach. So that pleasure of the flesh is always there. And then they're always a victim to it because they haven't done away with it. They haven't put it to death. Now verse chapter 29 is also a very interesting chapter. Let me skip through all my notes here. Twenty nine deals with oh. lost it. the Lord interceding for David again. Just as we've seen him intercede and take care of this whole situation, or this what we're getting ready to see is him take care of this whole situation where David's put himself in the encampment of the Philistines and now he's ready to go and fight against God's anointed people that he is the rightful king of. He is the leader of those people that he is getting ready to go fight. Now thankfully, some of the Philistine princes We're not okay with David going into Israel to fight with them. He did not want 301 Hebrew men going into battle against the Hebrew nation from the inside of the the army of the Philistines. So these princes convince the king of the Philistines to send David and his men back home after they've already made the journey going up against it. looks like David was willing to do it. I don't understand what was in his heart here, other than he was blinded by selfish, self-seeking, and trying to preserve his skin. Which will always put us in a bad spot. This chapter ends with this. We'll pick up in verse 11. It's a very short chapter, and that's really the gist of it. David gets sent back to... Um, Ziglag, where he's been living, where um, the Philistines has actually given it to David, and later on that will still, that will become part of Israel, because it was David's land and while he lived there. But verse 11 said, so David and his men arose early and departed in the morning, and returning to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now, going into chapter 30, now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacking Ziglag and burning it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great And they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Here again... What happens when we allow ourselves to only think of ourselves? It endangers our families. 
when we allow ourselves to encamp with the enemy because it's what strokes our flesh and makes us feel better and makes us feel secure, it endangers our family and takes them captive as well. This is such a sad story, but it's, it's the reflection of where David's mind has went and his heart has went. But he will return to the Lord. And there again is a picture of why he is a man after God's own heart. He repents. He seeks the Lord again. He doesn't say, I blew it and just walk away. Think of how he wrote the psalm, against you, O Lord, and you alone have I sinned when he had committed adultery and, and murder. Skipping forward to verse 17. Then David attacked them. You know, David hunts down the Amalekites. He actually finds a, a servant of the Amalekites that they had abandoned by the road who got sick, so they left him there to die. David finds him, gives him some food, nourishes him, lets him rest, and then asks who he is. He finds out that he is a servant of the Amalekites and that he was willing to show them where they would be camping as long as he did not kill him or turn him back over to that master that he had of the Amalekite. So once David got all that information and they found where they were camped, we pick up in verse 17, then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives. And nothing of these were lacking, either small or great, sons and daughters, spoils, or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Then David took the flocks and the herds, and they divided them before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. Very interesting here too, because what unfolds right after this is we know as we read through this passage, 200 of David's men, he's got um, 600 men and 200 of them were too weary to continue on this truck after the Amalekites. So he leaves them by a, a brook and returns to them. Now these 400 men that had went with him into battle said that they don't deserve anything because they weren't there for the battle. Here's David turning back into David again. He refuses to keep the spoil just for those who fought. But those who had been with him all this time, he gave them their portion. And not only that, he sent a lot into Judah who had been ravaged by the Philistines. And he wasn't there to fight against. So he sent a lot of the spoiled into Judah to those who had been ravished. So that wraps up, that gets us through to the end of that chapter. Now we're in 31, and here again we hit something very important. The tragic end of Saul and his sons. Again, a man who started off so well. He was God's anointed. He was head and shoulders above everyone else. He started out wanting to be God's man. He started out, not even wanting to be God's man, but once he was God's man, he took it as a badge of honor and he wanted to do what was right. But as authority and his prestige and listening to people around him about how great he was, all went to his head and filled his heart with deceit. And he became very disobedient to his Lord who had placed him in this situation. So now we see the taking him out. So chapter 31, picking up in verse one, now the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gil Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons and the Philistines killed Jonathan Abudai, 
and Malatia, however you pronounce his name, sorry, Saul's sons. So now his sons are taken out and knowing what David felt about Jonathan makes that this much harder to even read, knowing that they were two men with like minds, two men who loved the Lord and sought after him. But look at this, because of a misleading father, a father that did not follow after the Lord, he fell too. He was slain. Verse three, the battle became fierce against Saul and the archer hit him and he was severely wounded by the archer. The Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust it through me, through, thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But the armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. Disobedience will always lead to self-destruction. We harm ourselves as we disobey what the Lord's placed on our hearts. It's so amazing that we know this and we still find ourselves walking the other way after our flesh from time to time. Verse five. Then when his armor bearer saw that Saul had died, he fell on his own sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. Sin always leads to death. We get that picture again and even deeper. Verse seven, and when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the city and fled. And then the Philistines came in and dwelt with them, in them. So that it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent his sword through the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of Ashtor, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethsaida. That next picture, John. This is Bethsaida. This bottom area here was the Roman city called Bethsaida. If you look up on the mountain there, the hilltop, that's actually Bethsaida. Can you zoom in on the next, the next picture that you had? That would have been where the fortress was, where they put his body. As a matter of fact, this is not real godly, but that's supposedly a very popular tree. Any of you ever see Jesus Christ Superstar? That's the tree that um, Judas hangs himself on. When that was filmed, all of this was sand. You couldn't see any of the city. It hadn't been discovered yet. The Roman city of Bethsaida. And that's why I bring that up. It's amazing that all of that was under sand and they were not even aware of it in the 70s when they filmed. They have the buses and everything driving all over that area. But yeah, his, his body would have been put on top of that hill on the city wall. Blatant disobedience will always destroy and sometimes it will be very public just as we have here. God wants your heart forever, not starting off good and not saying that we love the Lord but as we go along our way 
our love turns to just comfort, comfort, being comfortable where we are in our son and doing what we please rather than living for the Lord who saved us. He doesn't want our heart for his ego, but for our good and his glory. You have a purpose to fulfill and you cannot be comfortable with the son that wants to invade your life. We have to take these things serious. Now, we've made it all the way to, to chapter one of Second Samuel. So let's see if we can actually do this. This is continuing everything that we've just read. It goes uh, seamless. It reaccounts a few things, but looking at verse one and two, now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites that David had stayed two days in Ziglag. And the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground, prostrated himself, prostrated himself, <laughs> excuse me. So here we've got this man showing up to give David the news of what's happened to his friend Jonathan, Jonathan's brothers, and the king. If we jump down to, to verse six, We will get all this information and how David handles this situation too. Because David questions him and wants to know why he knows all of these things and how Saul even died. Then the young man who told, who told him as it happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear. And indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called me, and I answered, here I am. And he said to me, who are you? And I answered, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me again, please stand over me and kill me. For against, oh, wait. For anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet which were on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Therefore David took hold of his own clothes and tore them and said, did all the men who were with, and so did all the men who were with them. So we've got this picture here of somebody lying to save their skin. This is not the same story of what had taken place. Here's a man thinking that he's gonna get prestige by telling the story this way, but not knowing how godly of a man David is and not knowing the God that David served. God would not, or David would not honor a man who touched, stretched out his hand against God's anointed. And even more so, the man who removed the, the crown and the bracelets and brought them to him. David is not going to be happy about this. But notice what he's trying to do. He's trying his best to stroke David's ego. So he gets position and gets to live. And also, like I say, he get position. He thinks that he's gonna have a, a standing in this kingdom. He'll be right by the throne because he's done what David needed done, even though it was all a lie. Verse 16, so David said to him, your blood is on your own head for you, your own mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. So David has him put to death. And the rest of this chapter is a song, a tribute to Jonathan and Saul. Again, a man after God's own heart. 
He only sees the good Saul ever did. After running for at least seven years, if not 10, from this man who wanted to kill him, he does nothing but honor him and writes a song for all of Israel to sing about him for all of eternity, all the rest of Israel's days. Well, chapter two, chapter two, David starts seeking the Lord again wholeheartedly because here he is knowing that he's come to that spot that he knew would sooner or later come that Saul would be gone and that he would inherit the throne. But it's not gonna be just as easy as that, that he just walks in and governs all of Israel. But let's take a look at this, starting in verse four. Then the men of Judah came there and anointed David king over all the house of Judah. And they told David saying, the men of uh, Jabesh, Gilead, Gilead, were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabez and said to them, "You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown the kindness of to your Lord, to Saul, and you have buried him. And you, and now may the Lord show kindness." and truth to you, I also will repay you with kindness because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant for your master Saul is dead and also the house of Judah has anointed me as king over them. So here he's, he's given Judah, but not all of Israel. Judah's just the southern portion. Could you go back to the map? Oh, I thought that was highlighted, but there it is. Yep. So still got all of that that's going to fight against him and actually enthrone Saul's son as king. So we start David's reign with a split Israel, with Judah and Israel to the north split against the king. Now Abner, the commander of Saul's army, is the one who actually pointed to the son and said that he needed to be king because he was the son of Saul and enthroned him in Israel. And then we read here in verse 10, Eshbosheth, yeah, say that 10 times, Eshbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So this isn't something that's just gonna go away quickly. Even though this king dies, Israel doesn't completely get behind David right away. They do it incrementally. Verse 16, and each one, oh, yeah, I gotta tell you this story. <laughs> I'm jumping way ahead of myself trying to watch the clock. Um, so with this all going on, the commander of um, Saul's son's army and David's commander bring out some mighty men and they meet at uh, the pool of Gideon. And they sat on each side until they decide that they're gonna have a champion meeting that they'll each send 12 of their mightiest soldiers out to fight and whoever does battle and wins, that will be the king over all the land. So we pick up in 16 and this is how it goes. And each one, each one of these 12 grasp his opponent by the head and thrust his sword through his opponent's side. So they fell down together. Therefore, that place is called the field of sharp swords, which is in Gideon. All 12 died on both sides, 24 men. They each killed each other. So 
This is a standoff. This isn't going anywhere. As a matter of fact, then it unfolds even worse because now Abner decides that he wants to take the throne from David. So this man that he's placed on the throne will have rule of all of Judea and Israel, and that will make him the lead commander over all of Israel. Jumping down to verse 22, so Abner said again to Ashlam, Ashel, Ashel, turn aside. So Ashel's following after Abner, after this all goes down and, and Abner's basically made it clear that he's going to stand against David. Ashel goes after him to put him to death. And this is a weird situation because he's able to keep up with him. He's able to approach him. He's able to encounter him and stand up for David. But look at what takes place. Abner turns to him and says, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How can I, how could I face your brother, Joab? However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of a spear so that the spear came out his back and he fell down there and died on the spot. So it was that as many as come to this place where Abner fell and died, stood still. What can we take from that? Sometimes just because we have the ability to do something doesn't mean that that's what we're called to do. We have to be led by the Lord. Just because we find an open door, is that door open by the Lord? Are we seeking him? Or are we just running through thinking headlong that this must be for me because it's open? Looking back on the proper characters of David, two situations where it surely looked like God had delivered Saul into his hands. He refused to do something because he didn't have the peace of the Lord. Here we have a man that ran out in front of the Lord and it cost him his life. The rest of chapter two is that battle between Israel and Judah. And then we'll jump down to, to verse 29 and pick up there as Abner Let's just read it. Then Abner and his men went on all the night through the plain crossover to Judah and went through all Bethorn, and they came to Manhelm. Oh. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing of David's servants, 19 men, and Ashler. Ashler, Ashel, excuse me, was killed as we just read, and that is as the commander had said, Joab's son, or brother, excuse me. And Joab is not going to take kindly to this man deciding to become David's man because of it. But look at this, the battle that waged between Israel and Judah. David lost 19 men, verse 31. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin and Abner's men, 360 men who died. Then they took Ashel, Ashel and buried him in his father's tomb, which is in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night and they came to Hedron at daybreak. Now, when there, there were a long, uh, the, no, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. And that tells the story of how we progress. And I really wanna wrap this up, we only got two more. Um, then Abner sent messengers because he gets into a fight with the son of Saul. He 
sleeps with one of the concubines of Saul, and his son spoke against it. But his son was not a warrior. He was not a strong man. And when Abner spoke back to him, he trembled. The only thing that he had going for him was surrounding himself by strong men. He was not a strong man himself, and he was not led by the Lord either. So because of this dispute and Abner seeing who he truly was and his fear, he deserts him and goes to David and makes a deal with David that he will become David's man. And David's okay with it as long as he brings his first wife, Saul's daughter, back with him. Then he'll meet him face to face and accept his desertion from Israel to Judah. And he does so. Now looking at how that ends up, Joab catches him on his way back into the city after all of this is taken care of, after he's returned David's wife. And he calls him aside and kills him. David is struck again by deceit. His men have put him in a bad situation. If he's going to rule over Israel, their commander was just killed at the hand of one of his men in a deceitful way. And this would spread all throughout the land. It's not the way that you want your king to be, a deceitful king. You want a king that's upright and led by God. And that's not the way that this unfolded. But now, then David said to Jaab, in uh, verse 31 of chapter three, then David said to Jaab, Joab, and to all the people who were with him, tear your clothes, gird yourselves with sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. The king, David, followed, or yeah, followed the coffin, the coffin of Abner. So they buried Abner in Hill, uh, Hebor, born, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. Now look at what Israel sees out of this. Look at verse 36. Now all the people took note of it, and it pleased them since whatever the king did pleased the people. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's intent to kill Abner, the son of Ner. Very important because now he's winning over the people slowly. And he is upset about this. He is not willing to live by deceit. He knows where that got him before. And think about that. All these seven to 10 years that he's been out in the desert or out in the wilderness running for his life, the Lord was working things out of David that he would need that character to be a good king. And that's something that we need to remember with the battles that we fight and wherever we find ourselves in wilderness places that the Lord's working something out of us that he can use later, that he's molding us into who he's created us to be. Unfortunately, we tend to make those situations a lot harder on ourselves than they need to be. We make the wilderness wandering 40 years rather than four days. Chapter five. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Haran, and spoke saying, indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out of bondage and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to David at Hedron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hedron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So now he's got the whole place, and he's ready to lead properly. Look at verse 25 where this ends, and David did so, and the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba, 
as far as Gizar, Gizar. The Philistines that had encamped in those cities that David was supposed to be there helping them with, he got rid of them completely finally. Now there is one thing that I jumped over that I am gonna look at real quick just because this is one of the greatest pictures in all of these stories that I've gotta share with you real quick because it starts here and I've gotta step on Chris just a hair. He, he, I don't think he'll mind. Back in chapter four, it says, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet and he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel and his nurse took him up and fled, and it happened as he, she made haste to flee, he fell and became lame. His name is, oh, I'll mess it up, <laughs> Mephibosheth. I love the story of Mephibosheth. Mephith, Mephith, Let's turn to chapter nine and see the rest of this. We're gonna jump forward just a little bit because this is very important. This is David's grand, or Saul's grandson. He's alive. Normally, if a king's descendants are alive, the new king would slaughter them because they're, they'd see them as the rightful heir to the throne. David was anointed by God. This throne was his, given to him by God. He didn't need to worry about those things. Look at verse, chapter nine, picking up in verse one. Now the king, David, said, is there still anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? And Zeba said to, king, to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Zeba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of of Marshar, the son of Amel, and Lo Debar. The king David sent and brought him into the house, up from the house of Mashar, from Lo Debar. And when Methivosheth, the son of uh, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David. He fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, <laughs> and he said, here is your servant. So David said to him, do, you not, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness so Jonathan's, for Jonathan, Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land, Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continuously. And this goes on. He repeats this over and over. What's so special about this? Why does this jump out at me? Why do I want to share this with you? Because the first time I heard this taught sticks with me. He was crippled by the fall. The king that should have put him to death invites him in to eat at his table continuously. Gives him a great inheritance that he didn't deserve anymore. This is a very familiar picture. Every one of us is crippled from the fall sin has made us lame and we do not deserve one morsel of the king's table. That last picture, John, and that's why I love this picture so much. We're invited to the marriage supper of the lamb where none of us should be allowed to be, but only because Christ has made a way and he has fixed our lameness. He has clothed us with his righteousness that we get to attend this. It's the very same picture that we get here. And what a beautiful way to close out this part of the scriptures, I think. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the pictures that you give us throughout it and that you never stop loving us, Lord. That you want to do a work in each of our lives, but you call us to something greater than, than being led by the flesh. You call us to lay those things aside and live for you. 
what else can we do when you were willing to die for us? While we were yet sinners, you showed kindness. You set a table. And then you called us into the feast. And Lord, we long for that day when we see you face to face and we are sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that we spend all of eternity in your presence. Continue working out those things of the flesh that your, your father, the, the perfect gardener, cuts away the things that hinder the fruit in our lives that we may produce more fruit. Lord, do the work in each one of our hearts that only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.